Good morning. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, May 28th. I'm Desiree Frazier. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, Mississippi has the country's worst maternal and infant mortality health outcomes. An expert in population health says a lack of public awareness of risk could be to blame. Then, this month marks the 70th anniversary of the Supreme Court ruling on Brown v. Board of Education. Plus, how have laws been rewritten over time as part of efforts to erase slavery from history? Those stories ahead with interviews. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Preterm births are higher in Mississippi than any other state. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Nearly 15% of births in 2022 occurred before 37 weeks gestation in Mississippi. Our Michael McEwen speaks with Dr. Thomas Dobbs, Dean of the School of Population Health at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Dobbs says health outcomes for both mothers and babies have gotten worse over time in the state, and a lack of public awareness is a big cause. When the baby is born, you know, far too early when it's not mature enough to thrive outside of the womb. And there's different forms, right? There's going to be a little bit preterm. There's going to be, you know, um, and then extremely preterm depending on, you know, how how far in the pregnancy it is. And there's several factors that are contributing to that. But Mississippi has really just an unacceptably high rate. And in fact, if you look at the CDC maps, our rate is so much higher than the rest of the country that our state has a different color than any other state on the CDC map. And are there any specific causes in Mississippi that, I guess, that earned it that unique color on the map? Yeah, you know, we just have such a high rate of preterm births, not only that, but pre, but also you know, infant deaths and also maternal mortality and, and morbidity. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Some of it is going to be, you know, baseline health characteristics, such as, you know, hypertension, diabetes, excess weight. And these are things that We know we're a real struggle in Mississippi, but there's other things that go into this that are more immediately remediable, you know, things that are system-based. It's going to be access to prenatal care. It's going to be access to health insurance so that, you know, moms can get into care quickly. There's also going to be an awareness of the importance of prenatal care, but these are things that are, are, are really, really challenging. The other thing is the way that our health system is, a lot of our care for pregnant women is really sort of a clinical, almost sort of like, you know, a disease state approach, right, where you're going to clinic and getting taken care of, where we know that cer- certain approaches such that are more supportive, uh, things that sort of, you know, bring more, you know, positive supports, more of a, you know, a, a, a basically almost like a protective cocoon around young, you know, young moms, pregnant women can go a long way in making sure that we optimize the likelihood of a healthy pregnancy. On the topic of improved access to health care, for pregnant mothers and especially especially prenatal care, was there anything that you saw during this legislative session that was considered or passed or that didn't pass that might address some of those issues to accessing that care? Yes, absolutely. There was a, a big success. Um, there was the presumptive eligibility bill that was that was set forth um, by uh, Representative McGee from Hattiesburg, and and that actually allows. Uh, pregnant women b- below a certain income threshold to immediately qualify for Medicaid. That's going to be huge for so many women because, you know, so many of our young working age folks don't have access to insurance. And so being able to get into care earlier is going to be is going to be absolutely critical. When you look at our access to prenatal care across the state based on health department statistics, a lot of counties, and, and especially if you look across, um, you know, a different sort of racial categories, half or so of women are not getting into prenatal care in the first trimester. And um, and about you know the same number sometimes are not getting adequate prenatal care. And so until we meet sort of that sort of minimal threshold of making sure women have access to you know, the most essential introduction into prenatal care and making sure that remediable factors such as, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, and things like that, that we can act early to prevent the adverse consequences to the pregnancy – until we can really optimize that access, we're not going to do everything we can from the clinical perspective. Is there one clear risk that predisposes women to preterm births or premature births? You know, there are, there are several different factors. Um, they are somewhat intertwined. Uh, obesity along with maternal hypertension, uh, these 
cause sort of structural abnormalities within the placenta that make the pregnancy less likely to be healthy, and that sort of contributes to uh, preeclampsia, which is going to be one of our our biggest problems if you if you you know if you're familiar with that. And but also other things like you know uh, diabetes, other health factors, but also stress in people's lives. And uh, we know that. Um, you know, women who are having a stressful pregnancy because their lives are stressful, that also makes the pregnancy less likely to, to be a healthy one. And what are the health impacts on especially a newborn baby if they're born preterm? Gosh, you know, if a, if a baby's born preterm, their body is not really yet adequately prepared to survive independently, right? Some of the biggest problems are going to be lung development, where the the lungs are prone to accumulate fluid or, you know, not able to, you know, provide what, what the baby needs. There's a whole other host of sort of complications that can go along with, with, with prenatal babies around infection, uh, neurologic damage, um, and, you know, a whole, a whole host of things. The, ba- the, body's baby, the baby's body is just not really prepared, which makes sense. The organs haven't fully developed, and so they're not optimally ready to survive independently. Dr. Thomas Dobbs is Dean of the School of Population Health at UMMC. Coming up, this month marks the 70th anniversary of the Supreme Court ruling on Brown v. Board of Education. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. MPB Think Radio's In Legal Terms is a show all about you and your rights. I'm host Adam Kilgore. I hope you'll join me Tuesdays at 10 a.m. or find our podcast to learn about legal issues that affect Mississippi. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. In 1954, 70 years ago this month, the Supreme Court ruled segregation laws in public schools are unconstitutional. It was the landmark decision Brown v. Board of Education challenging a separate but equal law for public schools in Topeka, Kansas. Today, the ruling remains one of the most prominent in the court's history. Although recent comments by presiding Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in a South Carolina redistricting case rebuked the decision, calling it overreach by the court, our Will Stribling speaks with Leslie McLemore, professor emeritus of political science at Jackson State University, about that decision and a founding member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. He talks about it all in part one of our conversation with Macklemore. He recalls what life was like following the Brown decision and the long journey towards desegregation. For me, it was very personal. Well, I, I do remember when the decision was rendered and I, I was in the uh, cotton field, chopping cotton, actually, with uh, some of my friends and my relatives. And I remember, in particular, having a conversation with my double second cousin, Essie Lee Wright. And uh, we were talking, figuring out the schools that we were going to attend. And I remember we had uh, a Catholic school, Sacred Heart School, here in Walls. And then that was the public uh, elementary school was in Lake Cumberland, Mississippi, and I remember S.C. and I talking about it, and I said to S.C. that I was going to attend uh, Lake Cumberland Elementary, uh, and later I was going to go to high school at Horn Lake, and uh, S.C. said that she was going to attend Sacred Heart. So I remember this gym discussion of 14-year-olds, and Essie was 12 years old, and we were in the field, so we were excited about uh, the possibility of going to an integrated school, and obviously we thought in our 14- and 12-year-old mind that we would be going to these schools the following year. We had no idea it was going to take forever to desegregate the schools, but we were excited about, about the possibility you know, thinking through the mind of a 14-year-old or 12-year-old black kid chopping cotton in Walls, Mississippi in 1954. Yes. 
what was it like in the the subsequent years where that thought that y'all that, you know that's it, log, logically you know again you think that's that's how it worked though that's what they you know that's what the justices said so this is what has to happen now and then that was just that was just not the reality for many years it was not and at that point i was going to the new hope uh mckay school in walls mississippi so it was a segregated two-room school. We had two teachers. I graduated eighth grade, 1956, in a segregated school system in DeSoto County, Mississippi. And the highlight uh, of my graduation was that black schools, or what they would call color schools then, consolidated the eighth grade commencement. And we had eighth graders from different sections of the Soto County graduating together, and I was one of the speakers uh, for that ceremony, for the graduation ceremony. And we held the commencement of the the Soto County Courthouse. Clearly, it was the first time, 1956, that black people had been in that courtroom for anything other than going to court, but they held the graduation exercises there. And that courtroom, large courtroom, was packed to capacity. And when I finished my speech, uh, they gave me a standing ovation. So I, I, I remember that as if it was like today or yesterday. And so we graduated and went then to Hernando Central High School. Hernando Central High School consisted of a, a former three-room elementary school building there in Hernando and a Baptist church and a Methodist church. And those three distinct buildings were the Hernando Central High School. And I started ninth grade there and went uh, to Hernando Central until my senior year. And my senior year, they built a high school for black folk or for colored folk in Walls, Mississippi, called Delta Center High School. So I graduated in 1960, and I went off to college at Russ College in Hollis Springs in the fall of 1960. And I was at Russ between 60 and 64, uh, which obviously was my major tenure in the civil rights movement uh, when I really got involved in the movement uh, as a freshman at Russ uh, and was involved in civil rights activities primarily in North Mississippi, but when I was elected president of the NAACP, uh, I got a chance to travel to different segments of Mississippi and other places because of my presidency of the NAACP. During your your senior year in high school, you participated in a boycott because Delta Center High School didn't have any black history books in the library. During the course of the academic year, as president, the principal of the high school, a great guy named Elias Johnson, assigned four different teachers to the student council. And he assigned the teachers because he wanted to make sure that we didn't engage in any civil rights activities in walls. So he wanted to make sure that he controlled the student council. And, uh, and we, on the student council, took offense to the fact that he had done that because there was really nothing in walls to integrate. But my suspicion is that he was fearful that the superintendent and the other members of the white board of education uh, would think we would demonstrate in some kind of fashion or march in some kind of fashion. But that was nothing in walls to integrate. We ha- We didn't have any stores to integrate. We didn't have any hotels. We didn't have anything to integrate, but that was just this fear because, you know, we're, we're looking now at, and this was the 59-60 academic school year, so we said we were going to boycott the classes because there were no Negro history books in the library. Number two, had too many teachers trying to control us on the student council, and then we didn't like the food in the cafeteria. So for those three reasons, we, 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 we organized the boycott. So when the, when, the, when the kids arrived on the buses, we had everybody to go to the gym. 
we taught classes, we sang songs, uh, we just stayed in the gym and didn't go to class. The compromise was that he would reduce the number of teachers advising us on the student council, that in the future they would begin to buy Negro history books, that they would improve the food in the cafeteria. So that really helped me in terms of my leadership development over time. That's Leslie McLemore, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Jackson State University. By fall of 1970, all schools in the state were desegregated. 32 remain under a desegregation order. In part two of our conversation... The fear of black people assuming power and taking over public life is something that white folks feared in 1949. And obviously, that is the great fear today in 2024. That's tomorrow. Coming up, how have laws been rewritten over time as part of efforts to erase slavery from history? That's ahead. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. What's your favorite type of music? The old standards? Country? A specific type of jazz? Maybe you love classical. In addition to thinking radio reading service, we broadcast MPB Music Radio. Listen live to essential and emerging artists from your HD radio, our app, or from mpbonline.org. From children's education to gripping drama, documentaries to comedy, MPB Television brings the world to Mississippi. With local stories, cooking, health, and music, MPB Television takes Mississippi to the world. Fill your weekend evenings with music broadcast from MPB Think Radio or stream from mpbonline.org. MPB Think Radio, whatever your taste, news, music, storytelling, or how-to shows. Whatever your city, Gulfport, Fernando, Meridian, Greenville. However you want, radio, smart speaker, smartphone app, MPB Think Radio. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Slavery was a backbone of the early American economy, and much of the nation's foundational law was written to preserve it. But as slavery was abolished, many legal experts, lawmakers, and judges have taken steps to hide that historical context. That's according to Ariel Gross, a distinguished professor of law at the University of California, Los Angeles. She's speaking today before the Natchez Historical Society about her research. Gross says preserving the legal history of slavery is crucial to understanding U.S. law and writing legislation that maintains equity and justice. Erasing uh, slavery from the stories we tell about the Constitution and from constitutional law has been a way to to deny slavery's legacies. And so those are stories that, of course, we see embodied in some of the monuments on our landscape. You know, Natchez, Mississippi has a history of a lot of memorialization that um, kind of fits into the the lost cause narrative about the antebellum past and a and a tragic era narrative about reconstruction and those have played out in the supreme court as well and they are today so that that's really what i'm interested in um, and of course those stories are contested we're seeing some real changes in places like natchez and the way the past is remembered so it's a it's a live issue, I think, how we remember the past and how it shapes the present. In talking about this, you mentioned portraying freedom as a gift from white people to black people, then denying the continuing legacy of slavery? Yeah. So one of the stories that I trace in constitutional law um, is this idea that the debt for slavery was paid by the war itself, by abolition, which is portrayed as something that, you know, the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln or, or just in general that, that white people bestowed on black people. I talk about the Emancipation Memorial in Washington, D.C., which portrays 
a, a standing Abraham Lincoln over a kneeling slave breaking his shackles so that it, it, it shows Lincoln giving slavery to a black man, when in fact the man who is being portrayed there, Arthur Alexander, was someone who seized his own freedom, as was true of so many black people during the war who uh, seized their freedom, left uh, plantations and farms, came to places like Natchez, where the U.S. colored troops were mustering, um, tore down the slave market, and uh, and turned the tide of victory for the Union forces. So that story about black agency is one that's really wiped out in the Supreme Court cases after the Civil War that basically say, we gave you your freedom, that's it, we're done, don't come back for more. And uh, and it's one that we see still in the case law today. And I'm trying to bring forward the other story that says, actually, Freedom and citizenship are something that people have been struggling for and fought for. And as Thurgood Marshall said on the bicentennial of the Constitution, that's the Constitution we want to celebrate, the one that's the product of that struggle, the Reconstruction Amendments that are the product of that struggle, and their full meaning, which folks have been fighting for now for 150 years. In your research, do you see any debates about the economy of uh, former slaves? Because if they're just released but have no uh, money, no form of earning money that is going to really be viable and make them self-sufficient, they remain in a state of economic bondage. Yes. And so the the book really starts in that moment of emancipation and and talks about the competing visions of what freedom would mean. And for uh, newly freed people, l- land ownership was a key part of that. So the, the idea of 40 acres and a mule comes from a wartime order of the general uh, uh, in charge of um, parts of the South who said, um, yes, land confiscated from Confederates should be uh, uh, divided among the people who work that land, um, the newly freed people, um, they should each get plots of 40 acres and a mule um, to become self-sufficient, you know, full citizens. And, um, and that vision is quickly wiped out and replaced um, in, and in large part because of rulings of the Supreme Court by a much narrow, much narrower idea of what freedom means. It just means the opposite of being someone's property. It just means owning yourself and nothing more. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean voting. It doesn't necessarily mean freedom from violence. It doesn't mean being part of public life or having economic independence. Dr. Ariel Gross, Distinguished Professor of Law at the UCLA School of Law, will be speaking about slavery and its impact on the rule of law at the Natchez Historical Society meeting. We really appreciate you giving us some insight into the work that you're doing on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio.